Thanks. Hi, Ben. Hi, Marjorie. <laughs> So we were going to do a little bit of a presentation, uh, a bridged version of one you've done before, and uh, hopefully keep this informal and chatty and leave time at the end for questions. Um, so should we, should we start by just, you can tell us the impetus behind the book and why it took eight years of your life. <laughs> Absolutely, what a way, how else could you open? Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, having me here and thank you for showing up and moderating this discussion. It is a huge honor and very exciting to be here and thank you everybody for coming and buying the book. It really means a tremendous amount to me. So the short answer for how this book came about was that my partner's sister, in uh, my sister-in-law in South Africa adopted a little girl um, who's Kosa, or properly said, Kosa, and she asked us to be godparents. And it was one of the few times I've been asked to be a godparent where the family actually went to church. So, um, you know, <laughs> the spec is normally, oh, just go to Baby cap, Gap and like take the little kid to, you know, museums when they're older. But in this occasion, you know, they actually do go to church and um, Satu to this day is in the choir in Cape Town. And I thought, well, I have always made my own Christmas cards and scrapbooked and things, and I'm studying the Old Testament. I was doing a PhD at the time. So I thought, well, why don't I just make her, you know, a little illustrated Old Testament, you know, as you do. And um, <laughs> to which Richard said, what am I going to get her, you know? And um, that's the short you know, impetus behind it. The the greater narrative, because there always has to be a, a, a greater story, is, you know, I was um, raised by a father who was a commander of a nuclear submarine. My mother was an Episcopal priest, and um, I think, you know, their temperaments and their politics were extremely divergent, and that maybe uh, predisposed me to some of the dysfunctionality that you find <laughs> in the stories of the Old Testament. So I always had, <laughs> always had this interest in this uh, great collection of ancient stories. And my mother went on to do a PhD in Old Testament. And when I became a religion major in college, she was delighted. And uh, years down the road, I found myself doing a PhD in the Old Testament using modern art and art theory to discuss how we can understand these ancient texts better. So I was drawing these trans-historical comparisons um, and, you know, <laughs> realizing I probably wasn't going to make a lot of money from that, decided, you know, maybe we could do something with what we made for Setu. So that's... Because right. children book so much money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so should we, should we start sort of going through some slides and talking about the art in the book and talking about how things... Sure, sure. So, the first slide um, is not the first page of the book, but it is, uh, introduces that it is a book about God. Um, as many of you know, God is invisible, and in, in ancient times and many religious people today believe it is not proper to say his proper name out loud. So, in Hebrew, what we in English would call the letters YHWH uh, spell out Yahweh, which um, I respectfully say, and it's read from right to left. So I've taken the first initial, Yod, and I'm using that as a symbol of the divine presence throughout the story. So instead of having, you know, an old man with a beard and a brown robe, I'm using this little symbol throughout the story, and it becomes a little thing that the kid can find. You know, it's not on every page. It appears at special moments. And I should, uh, I'll be getting ahead of myself, but mention that when we are making an app of this book that will be coming out in the spring, and this will be what the uh, child presses to hear the, the app narrate to you. They'll find God's name and they'll, you touch the letter of God to hear the word spoken. So. You know, before I came, I was reading it with my eight-year-old. And, the, you know, following the Yud through the text is a lovely way to keep a kid engaged while they're on your lap. And I wondered, you know, were you thinking of this as a lap book? Were you thinking of this as sort of an art book? for entire families or, you know, you know, what was, how did you envision the book being used, read, loved? <laughs> Well, I believe that it can be a book for people of all ages, colors, and creeds. And um, as naive as that might sound, I really wanted to 
bring these old stories into a modern, meaningful context. So I do envision it. I've really simplified a lot of the stories. I've, I've made the text very sparse, but lively enough that it's engaging, and I wanted to leave the illustrations uh, to encourage the imagination. And I really see, yeah, this is something that a, ch a child and a parent read together, and it encourages questions, you know, mommy, what's a covenant? And oftentimes, you know, mommy, why did Noah do this? There is this section at the back of the book that gives you the context and it gives you the biblical chapters so you can go to the real Bible and discover for yourself. And, you know, the Bible itself is, it's, it's, it's ancient. Its stories are not told in the way that modern fiction is told and, uh, or, or modern nonfiction for that matter. And, you know, we need to fill in the blanks. Like it's, it requires interpretation. It requires questions. And, um, so. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was really interesting was where, you know, it's, you know, this very calm, minimal, minimalist text. And then sometimes you did sort of add little, you know, quirky asides, or you sort of fleshed out characters a tiny bit, even though it's very small. And I wondered how you figured out as you were going, um, you know, the text isn't explicit about, you know, uh, what Cain and Abel were, you know, fighting about, and the text isn't explicit about sort of the Tower of, of uh, Babel and what, you know, what happened, you know, how language smooshed around. So how did you decide where you wanted to embroider a little? Well, I... I think everywhere I had to embroider, I had to, and that's what we as modern readers have to do. For instance, when God rests on the Sabbath, how did he rest? No. <laughs> in a bed, in the middle of the stars, on the seventh day, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to you know put it in in a context that is amusing and engaging, and also, I mean. Kids now have iPads and, you know, not to mention video games and other things, and so I wanted to really create illustrations that would capture their imaginations and not just be something that, you know, looks like every other book, so. Right. It's uh, one of the, you know, again, we're not sort of keeping to the uh, the way we talked about doing it. Let's just go with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the, this book is so gorgeously published. The colors are so clear. The paper is so heavy. Um, you know, tell us how you ended up with, you know, doing it this way, with starting a, uh, you know, it's clear that you don't do things small, but, <laughs> you know, starting a publishing company to do this, and um, and it's it's beautiful. It's very unusual for a children's book. Thank you so much, because, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, every step of it, I could tell you several tales of woe, you know, <laughs> about the printer didn't understand this, and I wish the paper could have been that, but um, I am happy with how it has finally turned out, and... Um, you know, several years ago, it was sent around to a number of big publishers, and there was quite positive response from a lot of editors, and I really thought I was going to end up with one of the big sick publishers, but the marketing people would always see it in the end and say, oh, but it doesn't look like anything out there, therefore it won't sell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to which I think, why would you want to do anything that looks like everything else out there? Um, but I just, there's a, there's a fear, there's a lack of imagination, I think, in these publishing houses, um, that you, they have to be able to label it as the next such and such, and I actually just took that as a huge compliment and and thought, well, you know, I'll show you. So um, my, my partner and I, uh, he is a novelist, and we decided to make an illuminated app of his novel, History of a Pleasure Seeker, for the iPad and um, I iOS devices. And we, you know, believe that digital devices can be incredible for reading experiences, but that actually most of these things are just full of gimmicks and distractions. So we really believed in creating things that could preserve the integrity of reading. So our app of this and our app of his book are not, there's no beeping lights, there's no ads, there's no, you know, sounds screaming at you. You can choose to interact with things that will enhance your imagination in the story. But um, when we decided to make his app, I mean, that was the beginning of the publishing company, and we're now lining up other books we're doing quite soon, I said, well, <laughs> we can surely add a hardcover to this publishing house, and that's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Um, should we move on and you want to talk a little bit about the paper cuts? Yes. So here we have Adam and Eve. Um, and the 
you know, as I mentioned, there's many stories I could tell about every single page, the whole process of making them. I, I draw the figures and then I, I cut out the, you know, the shape of them and then I paste it to a paper and cut out that pattern and then I paste it all on blackboard and then I have to process that in Photoshop, which is a whole nother, it's like making it all over again. Um, and the tree up there, I just want to point out that I specifically chose not to have a tree full of apples because that's a mistranslation that happens when the Bible gets translated into Latin. Um, it is actually fruit. So I found this old pattern that the Ashmolean Museum reproduces uh, in a wrapping paper, but it's from the 16th century, and I cut it all up into the shape of a tree. And then the little serpent is a, a, a stripey pattern by a, a Swiss designer, I think. And so whenever I use a pattern like that, you know, I have to, I'd have to get permission even though I'm not reselling it as wrapping paper or reselling something as a fabric, if you reproduce in this country, you have to get permission. Most of the time, people were very willing to let me use it and you know, gave me their blessings. Sometimes people would charge me. <laughs> I won't name names. <laughs> I, um, and uh, astonishing, that whole process. And then other times, and there were a few times when people said, absolutely not, I don't want my work used in a religious context. So um, I said again, well, I'll show you, and I <laughs> chose something else. So. <laughs> um, oh. I, just, I just want to interject that while the slides are good, that if you haven't opened the book itself and seen the illustrations and felt the paper, you are robbing yourself. It's mm -hmm. indescribably beautiful. If people didn't hear that, Nancy was saying that you need to actually see and touch and look at the book itself. Um. Somebody um, proposed at some point that I that I produce actual versions that have the real paper in them, and I thought, well, we could charge you ten thousand dollars a copy if you want. <laughs> we're gonna get to the the cloth, beautiful cloth cover beneath it, and but believe me, <laughs> we're gonna get there. Um, so, were there specific sort of paper choices that you were really happy with, where the paper worked with the illustration and with the the what what it was representing in a certain way? Or I'm sorry, I'm no, no. Uh, this is this is the perfect question for this slide okay, because good. Uh, here we have the time of judges, um, the people the people of Israel have, uh, or the Israelites have settled into the promised land. Give us a page number so we can look on the page. What page is this? I think it says 40, 41? 41. 41. Um, so they're living in the land in tribes. They're living in clans, okay? I was living in Scotland at the time, the land of clans, and so I decided to dress my tartan, my, my judges in tartans, right? <laughs> and uh, Delilah up there is uh, keeping her cool in a bird tree top and headband by Nisha Crossland. Um, <laughs> and the, the little headband uh, took me about 45 minutes to get right because, you know, you've got to get it just at the right, you know, angle and the whole thing. Um, so. So, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit about why these stories are so timeless. What makes them so resonant? Um, and can we talk a little bit about that with, with, with these folks? Sure. Um, I think that, well, despite the fact that this is, these stories have been passed down through Western tradition for uh, millennia, I think that what makes them so interesting is that they're about people who misbehave so often. And we get pleasure out of that. We like seeing people who behave like us. Um, the, Old Testament slash Torah, as I understand it, is not a moral treatise. It's really about showing what happens when our human will, you know, leads us down the wrong road and we lose touch with the fact that there is something greater than us that has promised us all sorts of wonderful thing if we just, uh, you know, <laughs> treat each other well, you know. So I think the... The pleasure comes from identifying with characters, and this brings us a little bit into folklore theory, where you know the Bible is full of figures that remind us of characters and other types of literature, and they're they're often types. So we have a character like Jacob, who it's all there's all these twins in folklore, right? Jacob is the younger brother, his older brother is outdoorsy and hairy. Jacob is a mama's boy with smooth skin, right? And <laughs> and contrary to what is expected. The younger one, the mama's boy, is the one who gets ahead. 
The same thing with the story of David and Goliath. You have this like basic pretty boy from Bethlehem who decides to go before this big giant Goliath and, and, and instead of battling it out with you know, a sword, he pulls a sling, slingshot out and that's how he gets ahead. So folklore is interesting because it's it really, thinking about it this way allows us to understand how Israel thought of itself. Like all these characters are kind of playing out Israel's own psychic understanding of its role in the world. And if you imagine, you know, this this tiny little country at the crossroads of all these huge empires that keep, you know, invading it and threatening to basically make it assimilate and and you know bend to the will and their ways and their gods. So Israel developed this, uh, this psychic way of, of being or understanding itself that said, you know, if you're going to survive in this world, you have to use your wits. That's sort of, that's sort of a statement. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well... You have a question? Uh, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna ask you. You, yeah. you were gonna talk about some specific artistic, uh, yes, references, S nods. Yes. So, uh, well, first of all, now we're on this page um, where we're as, after judges. The people decide to choose a king because they want to be like the rest of the nations. Because all these other countries around them have kings, and they just have these judges. You know, let's get on with it and be like everybody else. So, on the previous page, there's these these people protesting before Samuel the prophet and one of them has a little placard that says uh, pro crown and proud. So, <laughs> so, they, <laughs> so the kings, <laughs> the people get their king and, and God you know, says, all right, you wanna have a king, go ahead. And the first one, Saul, goes a little crazy. So here we have him uh, with his mad curls and his crown turned upside down. And in terms of the artistic winks, there are a number of places in the book where I, for my own sake and for any people interested in art who might know the images, um, you know, I, I make a little echo of, of a famous painting. So this one, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> is based on him. So <laughs> um, Earlier in the book, when the Hebrew woman is bending over the pyramids, uh, she's echoing one of Millet's gleaners from 1857. And my, my Adam and Eve on the opening page are silhouettes borrowed from a Gauguin painting of Tahitians in Paradise, and my Malevich Moses, and there's a, and my, my Matisse dove. There's a little winks in there, but anyway, a real artist doesn't confess these things. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered about the scarf. I, I love the, well, the neck drapery. Th oh, yeah. it's, it's also Nisha Crossland. <laughs> Very cool. She was great. <laughs> I'm into Nisha Crossland. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at the next. Next one. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that we were going to talk about was, which is, which you generally children's books really don't get past Genesis, yeah. and you very conscious about showing more than one, you know, wanting to go past that first book, uh, that first chunk. So let's talk. About yeah, that. Um, I think the state of children's Bibles um, and where I saw I had a niche is there's two scenarios. Either you have something that's so simplified you basically get five little stories that are disconnected and kind of meaningless if you don't if you know if if you're a modern person um and they're not you know, necessarily very interestingly illustrated. Um, but they, they'll do Adam and Eve, and they'll do Noah, and they'll do Daniel and, the lion, Dian, Daniel and the Lion's Den, and then that's it. The other extreme is that they just take a King James Bible and throw in kids' pictures, and I don't really know that that's gonna <laughs> work with really modern enticing. children <laughs> who have iPads. So um, I really, you know, my work in biblical history wanted to try to create as much of a consistent chronological narrative as possible and one of the th areas that they really the other the others really fall short on is is the prophets and particularly the exile and I'm quite insistent on having the exile in there because if there wasn't an exile, I don't think we would have a Judaism today and I don't think we'd have Christianity because that was the event that caused the people to bring their traditions together and really determine what it was to be Jewish. Um, so this is a page with the prophet Elisha who's purifying water and bringing a child back from the dead. And at the bottom is a little newspaper. This is when the Assyrians have invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. 
and I actually, if you zoom in closely in your printed copies, I did write little stories for each of these headlines. Um, so, you know, Assyria takes the north, Samaria in ruins, and at the bottom there's a little ad for a tribute concert to raise money for the refugees. Oh <laughs> <laughs> that, that little element reminds me of Sims Tayback. Right. The, you um, know, mm -hmm. yeah. I love the way the cyclone, typhoon, what do we call that thing? Whirlwind. Whirlwind, yeah, that's the yeah. one. Um, <laughs> that it just looks so kinetic and crazy and weird. And can you talk about the art on that one a little bit? Uh, sure. I um, Well, first of all, this is the book of Job, <laughs> reduced to one page. One of the <laughs> greatest achievements of my life. Um, <laughs> It is, you know, one of the most complicated books of the Bible because, you know, it's so hard to simplify it. I mean, Job suffers heavily and his friends tell him it's his fault and uh, God restores him after this big dialogue uh, when God visits him from the whirlwind. And, um, you know, it sounds all neat and tidy, but it's, it's really not. <laughs> um, so the paper on this page, I mean, I, I actually had all these strips of, you can see there's a black and white photograph in there. And I had all these strips of a, of a pattern by another, another English pattern designer. And um, when it came time to get permission, they, they would never answer my emails or my calls. And finally, I, you know, I really pressed them and they said, oh, well, we need to see a JPEG of the actual pattern. And I said, well, I don't have the whole piece of paper that I bought, but I have the SKU number, you know, the, the barcode and the, the, a small sample come on. And they, they, they basically wouldn't own it, but they told me I couldn't use it. They couldn't tell me which one it was. So um, on this particular page, uh, there is, those little photographs are actually um, from an old photograph of my mother oh. who studied the Book of Job and um, did, her, did her PhD on that. And uh, she died in 1995. So this is a homage to her. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's move on to happy subjects now. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Let's see. Tell us about this one. Okay. Um, this is um, Queen Esther, which again is a, a character not included in at least many of the children's Bibles I saw. And I wanted to uh, make sure I included a lot of uh, strong women characters in my Bible. I don't think that it's, um, you know, a totally patriarchal collection of texts. And um, Esther was exceptionally beautiful and exceptionally smart, and she becomes the queen of the Persian Empire and uses her wits to um, make sure that the laws protect the people of the land. And the little um, artistry on this lies in the stool she's sitting on. Um, beneath the seat is a little woven, I, I hand wove little pieces of paper into oh into rush seat, you know. And then the, the edge of her gown, the red and the orange, that's two layers of tissue paper layered on top of, between, of each other. That was when I started realizing the project had to come to an end. <laughs> 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 Got a little obsessive. <laughs> um, One of the things that I was curious about in the book was, you know, now that we're, we're talking about the strong women characters, a lot of, I see a lot of um, children's book authors really trying not to use a pronoun for God or just mm -hmm. repeating the word God over and or the Lord over and over again or, you know, or totally doing everything to avoid anthropomorphizing God in any way. I mean, you, you use the male pronoun. Was that something that you thought about? <laughs> I definitely thought about it. I mean, my yeah, whole my know. whole academic career was a pretty much one big adventure with feminist criticism, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, wanted to make sure I didn't represent God visually as male. Um, but then I thought, you know, it's it's a little bit going far from the source if I try to pretend that the Hebrew Bible does not gender God as masculine. I mean, there are there are actually parts of the Hebrew Bible where God is right. given feminine, feminine characteristics. Presence. Right. But um, I thought, you know, it's, it's making it a little bit um, awkward and confusing for a child if you keep calling God it, you know. Right. I, I, I don't know. And uh, literarily, it's awkward to just say, and God said this, and God, yeah. and just avoiding yeah. pronouns entirely. And exactly. So being yeah. like a weird... I, I do exercise. capitalize it as a sign of respect. So Rock on. Anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to do the next one? Yeah. So this is sort of the 
my, my mother, who's a professor of education, was rhapsodizing over the back matter in the book. So talk about, a little bit about the appendix and how you worked it. So this, the first uh, section at the back is called Read More, and this is where I have a little bit of context for each story, and I highlight the biblical verses that are related to that story in color, and I, you know, illustrate the margin so that it's not just boring old backup book material. Um, when we make the app of this, I can talk a minute about that. Um, you know, like I said, we're not really into these digital objects that just flash at you and distract you, and I think a lot of children's books are just full of game things, you know, that you're like you're chasing the feather across the page or you're trying to make this happen and, you know, there was the option to, you know, let you push Moses down the Nile, but then I just thought, you're not paying attention to the story. Right. And I've had it beautifully narrated by this British actress named Alison Hancock and when you touch the yod, like the text lights up as she's reading it to you and I just thought there's enough there without adding games. Yes. So to appify it a little bit more, we have a, a pull down menu. And so the back of uh, book material will be ex accessed by a uh, little pull down menu. And then there will be, and then last, second to last slide, this whole section where you can make the collages at home. So um, in the app, you would click on a little icon and then you would connect to the template online so you can print it out. And I'm also loading these free on my website, www.biblebeautiful.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they should be, they should have been up this week, but they're gonna be up by Friday. Um, yeah, and there's about 30 of them. So Excellent. Sunday Hebrew schools, you name it. Yay. Um, should we open up the floor to questions? Questions? Does it? Sure. Oh, yeah. Sure. I'll go out. Questions? Don't be shy. Ah, there you go. The young man in the back. <laughs> Who is your favorite character? My favorite character. Well, one that is very close to my heart is, um, I'm going to tell a little story. Uh, the, David's first wife was named Michal, and she was the daughter of Saul, the crazy king. And uh, she was in love with David, and we don't know if David loved her, but they got married. And um, one day David's coming home and entering Jerusalem with the Ark of, of the Covenant, and everybody's dancing around. And he's dancing so ecstatically that... Um, his clothes sort of fly off. And um, Michal goes down before the people and she says, you know, how dare you? Like, I mean, I cannot believe how you shamed yourself. And David says, how dare you? I was dancing before the Lord, you know? And, um, and it's very ambiguous, you know, what, what the meaning of the story, although I think she is there to show us that kings, you know, could be arrogant. And, uh, you know, God wanted the prophets to lead the people. Um, so she's kind of my favorite character because she's kind of like a power girl, you know? Anyway. <laughs> More questions? So, I'm super excited because I, I got to see the real plates. and They're just insanely gorgeous. And I see that it's to be continued. So, what's that all about? Great question. I, uh, you know, I want this to be read by Jews and Christians and anybody who's interested, um, even like the atheists who took communion at my wedding. Um, I, <laughs> I uh, you know, so for, for a Christian, it's to be continued because we now we then have a New Testament. For Jews, it's to be continued because the story of Israel keeps going on. So um, I thought I would wrap it up like that to, you know, leave it open. Anyway. Yeah. Could you, I also was very lucky to see the whole process oh, here, here, here. as it evolved. Uh, I talk about it. Oh, you, okay. Um, and uh, could you tell everybody about this sort of creative process that you went through with, you know, the style that you settled on and how, and how that sort of came about and then finding materials and colors and patterns and everything you sort of went through there? 
Sure. So collage was my chosen medium because as a scholar looking at the Bible and using art to talk about it, I was really struck by uh, you know how these ancient texts were grafted together and edited over these different centuries. And it really, the more I learned about what these historians were saying about you know this editor did this and left us, you know, they, they were like leaving the seams showing. They didn't make it all, they didn't smooth it all out into an even plane. It was like a collage to me. And the whole collection of these ancient books are so you know, disparate and multi-textured and so, you know, I thought if I'm going to illustrate this Bible, it's got to be collage and also, um, you know, I don't draw very well, so <laughs> I thought that was the easy way out. Oh, oh no, no, and I, I'm obsessive about uh, collecting papers. I mean, wherever I go, I go to the paper shop or I do this and that, but I've gotten much smarter about um, not choosing copyrighted things. So I'm going <laughs> to make it easy. Hi. Um, did you have a story in particular that you found most challenging in terms of demonstrating through fabric or texture or uh, putting a relatability quality to it? Um, was there one in, p in particular that comes to mind, maybe? Um, I mean, there was a, you know, generally these things, they kind of come to you, you just see it, and um, I certainly had to rework a number of them. You know, when Moses is smashing the tablets, it's really hard to get motion and anger and, you know, violence in two dimension, and I had to make that three page, uh, that, that page about three times. Um, you know, the wilderness experience, 40 years, you know, how do you make that seem long and arduous? in two pages and so I made a board game and all the little spaces say, you know, caught with an idol, go back to start and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> were there yeah. times that, that your vision for the art, sorry, were there times when your vision for the art when you could really see an image and that drove your decision to include part of the text or would, did they always go together or were you thinking of the stories first and then the stories you wanted to include first and then how you wanted to uh, illustrate them? I think I primar primarily storyboarded. I, I decided how much of the chronology I could fit in, and then, you know, in my second or third round, I, I inserted a few stories, and then that affects your whole page layout and double page. And if you put in this one, you have to add another one because in two pages you have you know, the Ten Commandments. So um, yeah, it was generally story, yeah, d dictated the illustration. It's also a nice thing about being your own publisher is you don't, you know, you yeah. dictate the work. Yeah. The page count. Yeah. Well, there are certain page counts that are better to have than others. So if it hadn't been 80 pages, it would have been 96. And I thought. I'm not quite ready for that. So. <laughs> yeah. so this is a Bible. I would say that uh, I was I offered to blurb it for um, Ben if he would let me use the quotation. This is the only Bible this Jewish lesbian has ever made it to the end of. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a it's a it's a Bible that strikes me as being neither white nor straight without being cloying in terms of um, it doesn't smack of political correctness. And I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about rocking on that particular teeter board. Yeah, well, it goes back to the fact that I made the original for my goddaughter, and you know she is black and I am white, and I had to get my head around this. How do I, if I make a white Bible, it's going to distance her. If I make a black one, she's going to think, oh, yeah, my white godfather made this black Bible for me, you know. <laughs> so uh, I uh, just thought, well, how do we do this? And so I chose the brown craft paper. Um, I quite frequently, you know, the, the hair is quite kinky. I want, you know, and it's, it's like how you see it and how you relate to it. And my, um, my New Testament that I almost halfway through, um, you know, Jesus is quite, he's quite African. You know, he's got kind of an afro and uh, I think why not I mean you know I, I'm not into blonde Jesus you know are there any like prequels or like ones before this or are there going to be another sequel because it says it's in a series Yes, yes. There's going to be a New Testament after this one, and then I would like to do individual books of the Bible, and obviously there's a limit to how many one person can do in a lifetime, but um, I'd like to do, you know, 
some of the lesser known books like Judges rather than just another Genesis, which, you know, anyway. <laughs> Leviticus. Leviticus, of course, yeah. <laughs> really? So much you take it. Um, so the characters are faceless, they're missing uh, features. Was that also a unifying component for your niece? Absolutely. I uh, was very firm about the fact that I didn't want the characters to have faces. I think that literalizes it too much. I think, you know, we don't know what these people looked like if and when they were actual people and not folkloric figures. And um, I learned early on in the process that actually um, Rudolf Steiner designed dolls that didn't have faces on them. And it was a way of, you know, allowing children to uh, import their own emotions and things onto their dolls and, and it cr creating a bigger bond. And so, yeah, I wanted it to be, I wanted the faces to be open and to be, you know, things that could be imagined, so. I'll, I'll weigh in. I just actually want to thank you so much for um, creating this for someone who was raised Catholic in the 60s um, and knew nothing about the Old Testament. It just wasn't part of what you did when you were a Catholic going to, you know, catechism. The Old Testament wasn't part of it. And um, I'm a fanatic reader of... of um, you know, 18th, 19th century literature and 20th century literature and um, the Bible's all throughout. The Old Testament just keeps coming up in all great literature and I have no idea what it, they're talking about. <laughs> now I do! <laughs> and I don't have to go through the whole Bible to find out. So you've done a great job for me. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. I really did want it to be a, um, a, a reference tool as well, you know, like a coffee table reference tool. Um, and just before, I want to make sure I point out that the reason I ended with this is because if you all remove the jacket of your book, you'll see a gold foil embossed cloth cover. Oh. That is <laughs> the only thing is, why did we have to have the jacket? <laughs> That's so darn nice. Sorry. One more. I, uh, I, I don't have a question. I have a statement. Um, you mentioned Sims Tabak, who uh, was a very, very dear friend of mine, whose books reflected the uh, Jewish state in Russia, Poland, and Eastern Europe, and uh, Joseph and his overcoat and things like that. But his style was so, was very, very um, homey. I don't know how else to say it. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, the graphics in this book are beautiful, just, just gorgeous, and totally different from any that I've ever seen. Uh, and I think it's because of the collages, but the, the, I'm, I'm so surprised that you weren't trained as an artist. Is that true? Um, not on the long, I did have a little painting growing up, yeah. but really it was the, it was the studying art history. I did a master's at the Courtauld and right. continued to use it in my PhD. Um, but um, otherwise, physically, you know, self-taught, yeah, but well, thank you. Congratulations, it's absolutely thank you. gorgeous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.